Um, so good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lee White, Research Fellow at RegNet, um, here to welcome you to the Con RegNet's conversation series. And thank you all for joining us today. I know everyone is balancing a lot as the pandemic continues, and it's great to see so many people here um, for the conversation series. Our theme this year is connection and disconnection, and I'm excited to welcome you all today to the first panel, Relationality in a Complex World. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the unceded lands on which we are meeting today and pay my respects to elders past and present. I am on Ngunnawal and Nambri country, but know many of you are joining us from other lands near and far. As a school that cares deeply about questions of justice and equity, we at Regnet stand in solidarity with the First Nations activists and communities who have been working to bring attention to struggles still faced by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. RegNet is a hub where we collaborate between disciplines to understand how governance and regulation are shaped by connections and disconnections. COVID-19 has redefined the meaning of connection and disconnection. The global pandemic has disconnected us in ways we could not imagine, but despite that, we keep finding new ways to connect. At the purpose of Conversations 2021 will be to host a series of panels aiming to illustrate how connections and disconnections shape outcomes across domains, including justice, welfare, and trade. Conversations is a series that emerged to capture discussions happening in the RegNet building and spark new discussions across RegNet and beyond. However, not all voices in RegNet are represented here. We're over 20 months into the COVID-19 pandemic and not everyone has experienced the disruption of this pandemic in the same way. The uneven distribution of the load of the pandemic is one of many factors shaping the voices that are captured in this discussion. And it's one of many areas where we need to continue to have conversations now and in the future. I'm excited to hear from today's panel who will be speaking on relationality across a range of domains and theoretical jumping off points. The panel will be facilitated by Associate Professor Miranda Forsyth, uh, an expert in um, law and justice and uh, focused on the central analytical question of how people's diverse justice needs can best be met in context of multiple legal and normative orders. The panel, I would, I would like to thank Miranda and Dr. Mary Graham, Felicity Gray, Mary Ivick, and Dr. Ibby uh, Lassance um, for the conversation to come. Before I hand over to Miranda, a couple of housekeeping items, uh, which you can also see in the chat there. The webinar will be recorded and your name and voice will be recorded and audible to others listening to that recording. Uh, the video and audio of our speakers, including their shared screens, will be recorded. Throughout the presentation, your video will be turned off and you'll be muted, so we will only be able to hear the speakers and conveners. But if you would like to ask a question, um, you can do so by submitting your questions in written form via the chat, or you can raise your hand at the end of the presentation and we'll take you off mute to ask the question. If you're on social media, you can tweet live by using the handle at AMU Regnet. Um, and with that, I'll hand over to Miranda. Thank you, and I look forward to the conversation. Thanks so much for that, Lee, and um, thanks everybody for joining us today. It's, um, as Lee says, it, it's really difficult at the moment to, to find time for these moments. So we're hoping that we'll make some really good connections um, as we go through the, um, the session today, which is scheduled to go for an hour and a half, unlike our usual um, RegNet seminars. So I'm going to provide some introductory remarks and, um, and then I'm going to explain how the, the rest of the session is going to play out. Uh, I should say that one of our speakers, um, Dr. Mary Graham, isn't here, but we're, we're trying to contact her and, and hopefully she'll be able to join us before too long. So I'm going to share my screen. Uh, Okay, has everybody, can everyone see that? Assuming yes, excellent. All right, so um, this is a photo from, um, from Enga province in Papua New Guinea where I do um, a lot of work and where relationality is really at the heart of, um, of the way in which governance works in a, maybe in a far more um, apparent way than it is in Australia. But um, as we would argue, relationality is everywhere. So I want to, um, to talk a little bit, first of all, about, well, what do we mean by relationality? 
I think that probably in essence, adopting a relational approach to really anything means foregrounding the work of relationships in constructing social reality. So in other words, we don't just think about relationships as things that emerge from ourselves and from our institutions, but we also think about the way in which relationships actually create and shape our social and institutional and therefore regulatory world. And the person who I found who I think has, um, has expressed this in the, the most convincing way um, is author Ian Gilchrist. And he spoke about the fact that relations are prior to relata. He said, this sounds like nonsense to most people. How can relations exist before there are things that relate? But things only become what they are in the process of the relationship. We are only what we are as human beings in the process of the many relationships we have with other people and with the world at large. He then goes on to explain the fact that there's an image in the Vedic tradition of Indra's net, and sometimes it's represented as a spider web, which is what I've put here, a cosmic net that covers the whole world. And in it, at every point where the threads cross, there is a little jewel. And reflected in that jewel are all the other jewels in the whole of the net. And in this tradition, they point out that the threads exist before anything else, before that crossing. The things that make it a net are the crossing, but the threads are what exist first of all. But we have a tendency not to see the threads. We only see what, what stands out, um, what stands forward to us in the world. And we neglect the background out of which they emerge and from which they are never separated. I'm going to return to this point about foregrounding and backgrounding of relations in a minute. But part of what we want to do in this panel really is to bring the work of relationality from the background into the foreground. When we're thinking as well about what role does relationality play in relation to um, connection and disconnection, the, the theme of the conversation series, then I found this Connivan framework to be really helpful. Connivan is a framework that's developed by Dave Snowden, uh, and he uses the, these four different, different quadrants. So he says, well, there's, there's the clear, which is the known and the familiar. Well, we're all very aware of um, cause and effect relationships and we can predict what's going to happen. Things get a little bit more complicated when we move to the complicated quadrant where things are knowable, but they're a bit unfamiliar. We need to have guides and experts to, um, to help us to make sense there. Uh, the complex quadrant is where things are not so predictable. There's a lot of contingency. There's a lot of unknowns that occur and there are patterns, but there are patterns that we only really can see in hindsight, not when we're in the middle of them. And then finally, there's the chaotic quadrant where even in hindsight, there is no pattern. Uh, it's completely, um, the, the relationships between cause and effect are not perceivable. And the idea of this framework that I particularly like is that it is a dynamic framework. So people and institutions and events are moving around from the clear quadrant to the chaotic quadrant, for example. You can see that, you know, you can fall off a cliff. You can think things are simple and then suddenly you're in chaos. Or you can move from chaos through back into clear, through laboriously climbing up um, ladders. And just as a thought experiment, I'd like you to think about the last time that you suddenly found yourself in a quadrant that is very different to the one that you thought you were in. If you're anything like me, it's been a failure of relationship that has led to that sudden plummeting from the simple, for example, to the chaotic. Or conversely, it's been that web of relationality that has enabled you to rebuild, to move out of chaos, to, to climb up into where things are um, more manageable. And I would argue that this doesn't just happen at the level of an individual. 
Um, it doesn't just happen at a level of community. It happens at all sorts of scales. It happens, you know, really uh, at the international scale as well. So I might just say China, Australia relationship, nuclear submarines and Pfizer vaccination supply um, to give a few really recent examples of the role that relationality has played uh, in, um, in national politics in Australia. One of the, um, the questions that we've been thinking about when we've thought about relationality, and I should say that um, this is some work that I've been doing with, um, with my colleague, Dr. Gordon Peake, who is going to join us um, later on in the, in the conversation. And this is um, uh, an idea that he's had is whether or not uh, relationality might be thought of as the third rail. So what I mean by that is that although there are these networks, um, webs of relationality that create our social and professional lives and shape our institutions, power the operations of state around the world, in lots of ways, these relationships are intangible. They're both hidden and they're also taken for granted. So they're routinely ignored until suddenly they're not there and everything stops working. And that's when we go, we plunge off the cliff into the, the chaos quadrant. But we might even go further and say that there's a definite antipathy towards talking about relationality. It's like it's so dangerous that it might explode in your face if you touch it. And in politics, there's this concept of the third rail that's used as a metaphor for any issue that is so controversial that it's charged or untouchable um, to the extent that, you know, if anybody, particularly a politician, um, dares to broach the subject, then they'll inevitably uh, suffer politically. And it refers, of course, to the idea of the high voltage third rail in some electric railway systems, which is why I've got the, um, that image there. But we wonder whether or not um, it's the same for relationality. Uh, is it something that is really almost too scary to, to start to bring up um, in case it, it has that sort of um, explode in your face uh, consequence? Or sometimes is it not brought up because people just think of it that it's so banal that we can afford to overlook it? Uh, the question is, if we do overlook it, then what is the cost of doing that? I'm really happy uh, to say that on this panel, we have a group of, um, of women, which is um, you know, uh, uh, an unusual feature of a lot of academic panels. Other panels in this series will have men. Um, so you know, there, there is overall some, some gender balance, but this particular panel um, brings to you a group of women um, who are not afraid to touch the third rail, who argue indeed that uh, the world we need uh, needs to be able to understand the role that relationality um, plays in moving around the course of events, as we like to describe regulation. Uh, we were going to find in this panel ways, different ways to account for relationality in all of its different forms. Uh, and I, if I haven't already used too many metaphors, here's one last one, which is that of dark matter. Um, dark matter is all around us. We know that it's there, and yet scientists have found it extremely difficult to, um, to actually account for it, to, to understand, to map where is this dark matter? What is it? What are the substances that, that contribute to it? So that's hopefully what we're going to be doing in our panel today. Uh, so Mary Graham, if she's joined us, was, is going to provide a bit of a, a theoretical overview. Um, if not, we'll just jump straight into uh, the three case studies that we've got. Um, and those case studies are intended to illustrate not just how relationality is used for observation and description, um, but also as an analytic um, to provide some of the implications that relationality has got for regulation. Mary is going to talk first of all, Dr. Mary Ivex, sorry, is going to um, talk first of all about relationality and glyphosate. Uh, then we're going to turn to Dr. Ibi Lassange, who's going to talk about 
relationality and the far right. And then um, Felicity Gray is going to be talking about relationality and the protection of civilians. We're then going to have another round of discussions between um, the panel members with each commenting on um, a particular feature of um, each other's work. And then we're going to open up the panel to discussions, to um, questions from, um, from the audience. So if you've got those questions, then please um, put them into the, into the chat box or into the Q&A. Uh, I'm going to, sorry, I'm, I'm on a, a very small computer at the moment. Is Mary Graham is here? No. So we're going to then, um, we'll, we'll jump into um, Mary Ibeck, who is a, um, a PhD scholar here at, at Regnet. Um, so Mary, over to you. I'll stop sharing my screen. Thanks, Miranda. Let's make sure I've got the right one. Okay. Um, thank you, um, Miranda, for that. I'm glad you said PhD scholar because I thought you got Dr. Mary Graham. I thought I heard a Dr. Mary Ivick. I wish. <laughs> I'm trying to get there. First, I'd like I, to. I heard that and then I realised afterwards I hoped you hadn't noticed. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, one day. So, I'd like to firstly acknowledge and celebrate our first Australians on whose lands we're all meeting. Um, today and to pay my respects, especially to the Ngunnawal elders, past, present and emerging, and my respects to you all. I'd like to offer today this idea and to invite criticism and questions and, and your guidance. This idea of regulation as relationship and relationship as regulation looking at the case study of glyphosate in Australia, which is also um, more commonly known as the weed killer roundup. So I'd first like to um, take you to this image, which is really the punchline. Um, and that's really to um, let you just sit and look at that while I give a brief explanation of what it is. It's a photo that um, was taken of a collective gift presented in 2018 to Ngunnawal elders here in Canberra and um, who are leading um, a restorative health research um, team of which I'm a part with um, the University of, of Canberra and um, colleagues there include uh, Dr. Holly Northern, Auntie Ross Brown, um, my Appleby and others. And this was a gift um, which was presented by a Maori spiritual elder, really skillfully crafted the volcanic mount, the volcanic mountainous volcanic volcanic rock um, sitting on, on top, um, balanced very carefully on the riverbed rock. And these rocks are sort of taken from the northern and southernmost points of the North Island of New Zealand. And the engraving of the waves reminds us of the ebb and flow of relationships and the forming and reforming of relationships and the influence of the environmental um, factors. The eucalyptus leaf connects us to Ngunnawal country. So it's sort of physics and chemistry and biology all in one. And I think when you sort of sit with this, with these rocks and, and this leaf, you see how finely balanced um, our relationships are. And when you just knock the table very slightly, the volcanic rock tumbles. And so we really sort of see this momentary time, this, this sort of snapshot in time when our relationships seem to be in balance, but generally they're characterized by movement, by being created and recreated 
always under pressure of some sort, always being influenced by different things and very vulnerable to being tipped out of balance. This is how our contemporary Western thinking frames relationships and regulation, boxes, arrows, focusing on entities and actors more so than the actual relationships between the entities. And I'm, I'm missing Mary Graham um, tremendously because I was so looking forward to um, hearing her frame um, as she did for us last week. And um, I was reading an article by another PhD student at Macquarie University, Lauren Tynan, and I contacted Lauren and I said, look, I'm going to be talking about, you know, your writing and, and um, Lauren's a, um, Tuwulwe woman from northeast Tasmania to Bukuna country, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. And Lauren presents, um, uses Mary Graham's work, Emma Lee's work, and other Indigenous scholars to tease out and describe relationality. That's a really great article. And Lauren sent me an email back saying, I'm really thrilled to have connected. I'm just about to go off and have a baby, but let's talk again when I'm back into the PhD. And so this sort of organisational chart, and you know, th this is generally how we think about relationships and, and regulation particularly. So my training was in social work. And so that training was framed by an ecological systems approach and an, eco an ecological systems theory by Groff and Brenner. It's sort of a person in an environment where multiple interacting levels of influence impact human development. And so I'm actually really um, glad to see this sort of more, um, sort of in this greater engagement with sort of relation relational theory and relationality and all this that we are talking about because to me regulation and responsive regulation restorative justice to me these are deeply relational activities um, and so always sort of feeling apart from Judith Healy and Gail Burford my sort of fellow social work regulatory um, colleagues I've always sort of felt be great to get more conversation about um, relationship and, and I'm so thrilled that this is happening because I think that it is sort of one of those under the hood topics um, and, and to explore it more openly I think is, is really important in our understanding of, of, of regulation. So I'm sort of using these concepts of relational ecologies in unpacking the glyphosate story trying to organise the data in terms of historical, cultural and ideological relationships that have shaped glyphosate regulation in Australia over the past 50 years. So in the regulation of glyphosate, I'm asking questions like, what are the relationships that matter to whom and why? Why did they come to matter? How did they come to matter? How are these relationships supported? How are they constrained, ignored, dominated perhaps, or balanced, and with what consequences? And how might a relational framing of regulation influence or help us transcend the polarized debate, um, in my case, for glyphosate? And how might we bridge this relational divide and what are the spaces for dialogue um, to address these contested issues? So it was really hard to work out what to say in five minutes, but basically, again, the punchlines that seem like Miranda already stated at the beginning seem fairly banal. Um, and yet it does seem that we have to remind ourselves that all relationships are important. They all matter. In the study of the glyphosate regulation, civil society, professionals, industry, government, all have a, a role to play, all are regulatory actors. 
And while I initially thought, oh, yeah, I can organise these in sort of nice, neat quadrants of the circle where part one quadrant will be civil society and the next quadrant will be professionals, etc. Pretty much on my very first interview, that was blown out of the water because people said, well, Mary, I'm a farmer, but I'm also a scientist and, you know, I'm also involved in, you know, consumer, consumer movements and land care and I thought this is a bit more complex than just one single identity. So people had multiple and overlapping identities and there were multiple truths and multiple stories. And again, a statement which seems pretty ordinary, all relationships are complex and you don't even have to think about glyphosate and the organisational chart. You can just think about your relationship with a parent or a parent figure or your child and you realise just how complex relationships are. And all relationships have a capacity for good and for harm. And so I think we need to sort of remember that, um, that this is um, a feature of, of relationships. And so to understand, to really sort of enter that world of truths possibly that are uncomfortable to us, to not necessarily agree, but to try to walk in the world or get to know someone else's world. It is actually about needing that empathy and to also be able to hold a space where conversations can be had. And I love that term of Mary Caldwell's about islands of civility and how even in war zones, we still have pockets of civility and and i think that the glyphosate story you know as as i sort of spoke to whether they were farmers or industry people or civil society i mean that space that emerged was land care and the fact that land care groups bring together multiple perspectives and are able to embrace this diversity in thinking and I'm followed really probably over time. And, and this is just sort of just taken from the website in terms of the um, land care, which has been going for, um, well, officially since about 1986, but 1950s. And, you know, I would argue that land care is our Indigenous um, brothers and sisters have been doing this since time began. So really what we're seeing in land care is many active volunteers. We see a diversity of, of groups where we have farmers, landowners, um, industry researchers. And so I think these are the spaces where we really need to examine more closely um, as these regulatory sites of relational um, activity of where we can sit with the complexity and the um, and some of those polarised views and we can actually understand how we might be able to um, curb the harms and maximise the benefits of something, for example, like glyphosate. I'm going to end it there. Thanks, Miranda. Thanks so much for that, Mary. Um, we'll turn now to Ibi. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm not just going to share my screen too and then just um, go into my presentation. Um, can everyone see my screen? And can hear me? Thank you very much. So um, I would like to start to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we on which we each are, and also pay my respect to Indigenous knowledge. And um, as the title such oh, and before I start, I'd just like to warn that there will be voices of hate in my presentation. Apologize for that, and just let you know that I carefully considered the need and the purpose for including those quotes. Now, as my title suggests, I look at Australian far-right extremism, or FRE, and its connection with the far-right ideologies in the broader Australian um, structural, cultural, and political landscape, and how these two spaces reinforce and sustain each other. Now, FRE is not new in Australia, 
but it's certainly on the rise. And uh, the shortest way to describe it is that it's an anti-democratic opposition to equality. And they are willing to assume both offensive and defensive stance. And their strategies can include gaming democracy to entryism, or street fights, or terrorism. And while the media focus tends to be on the violent end of the spectrum, for much of the FRE, Field, the main goal is the shifting of the mainstream culture and discourse to help them to recruit, to radicalize and mobilize individuals towards violence, and to normalize and legitimize their ideas. So for the next few minutes, um, I'm just going to present some examples of far-right ideals in the mainstream and how they connect with the four main tenets that, in my view, best characterizes the FRE movement in Australia. And those four maintenance are up on the screen. So because of the brief time, my focus will be on the second one, which is exclusionary and dehumanizing ideas. Now, the purpose of these ideas is to establish clear lines of superiority and inferiority according to race, ethnicity, gender, religion, or sexuality to justify their violence against those groups. But exclusionary ideas are also part of our mainstream. They are a product of racialized institutions and historically situated hierarchical social structures, justifying violence and injustices against minorities, such as indigenous Australians. And the refusal of the government to deal with these injustices reinforces the sense of superiority and dehumanizing ideals of the far-right extremist groups. Similarly, the repeated political rhetoric against Muslims and racially visible groups from the government normalizes um, intolerance. Now, at the last election, in response to the proposal to increase annual refugee numbers, Peter Dutton claimed that they won't be numerate or literate in their own language, let alone English. In the same interview, just a few minutes after that, he said, these people would be taking Australian jobs. There's no question about that. Um, now, these may appear to be two seemingly contradictory statements, but they actually resonate coherently um, with all four concerns of the uh, far-right extremist movement in Australia. Refugees are identified as demographic threat who are taking your jobs, thus legitimizing victimhood of the FRE, and the fears and the need to protect themselves from being outdone by individuals from a group perceived to be beneath them, hence the statement for being innumerate and illiterate. This FRE narrative of accelerated threat, which requires violent solutions and actions, is reinforced by the frequent nationalism discourse and crisis narratives from our government and violence as an operating principle in response to minorities such as asylum seekers. Now the focus of my next example is going to be on the scale of the structural embeddedness of racism. In a secret recording, a member of the NSN, a neo-Nazi group in Australia, and the senior security manager at Crown Resorts at his day job, taught how he regularly denigrates non-white employees at his work. He said, obviously it is a diverse workplace, but the funny thing is all the upper management are all white. So, you know, I got no issue bossing around, sorry, I can't say it. And I just get them to do shit jobs. What we can see in this example is how current Australian structural workplace conditions create an environment where he can gratify himself by engaging in racist behavior every day. Distressing people based on their race at his work is just part of the game. What's also part of the game is the appropriation of ideas of equality in his language that is diverse workplace, which really designed to be an up yours. He's having fun with it knowing that the charade of diversity and non-discrimination at his workplace is part of his weaponry. And my very last example is about the demonizing rhetoric in the mainstream of LBGTQ people. 
In 2019, Cory Bernardi once again defended his comments that legalizing same-sex marriage has led to advocacy for bestiality and pedophilia. Now, directly correlating minority liberation with pedophilia and other offensive acts is a textbook strategy of the FRE. It is capitalizes on mainstream repugnance for such acts, and so intolerance is covered with a seemingly altruistic facade. So when he equates marriage equality with bestiality, he's not a laughable lunatic, as I used to think. He's subversive and dangerous. So in conclusion, um, what is the, you know, um, where is relationality comes into this, mainstreaming is critical to the current surge of uh, far-right extremism in Australia. And categorizing and isolating far-right extremist violence from far-right ideologies in the mainstream is a false disconnection and a destruction from a less overt but more dominant structural and institutional violence that fuels far-right extremism. And I had another conclusion about methodology, but I'm running out of time, so we might have an opportunity to discuss that one later. I think it is something that's probably common for all of us anyway. Thank you. Thanks so much, E.B. Um, and I'm really delighted to note that um, Mary Graham has joined us. Welcome, Mary. Uh, what, what we'll do is um, just turn to Felicity and then, um, and then Mary, you after Felicity, if that's all right. Yeah. Yep. Great. Okay, then over to you then, Felicity. Okay. <clears throat> Can everyone see the slides? Okay, great. Um, it's a real pleasure to be able to join everyone today um, from Anna Costin lands in, in the Washington DC area. Um, you know, as, as Mary mentioned, um, and as Miranda mentioned earlier, and as Mary will talk about soon, um, <clears throat> Indigenous thinking is really fundamental um, to the way that um, I understand relationality theory and the way that it's been applied. Um, I'm really glad to be on the panel here with Mary Graham today. Um, she's a scholar that I use a lot in my own work, um, but also Native American scholars like Robin Wall Kimmerer. Um, so yeah, I feel grateful to, to be um, speaking from Anna Costin land today. I'm going to give a quick overview of how I've been using rela relationality theory um, in my work on the protection of civilians from violence. Um, it provides the framework for my PhD thesis, but also for related research. So today I'm going to talk about a paper that is hopefully soon to be public um, called Protection as Connection, Relationality Theory and Protecting Civilians from Violence. Um, and in it, I use relationality to understand both how relationships constitute protection and also how protection architectures and hierarchies shape relationships between different actors in conflict settings. The basis of the paper um, critiques a, a trend in international relations theory, but, but I think in academia more broadly, where there's a fixation on um, individual actors as the unit of analysis, as other um, panelists have mentioned. Um, and in that sense, the protection of civilians from violence is most often understood in fixed identitarian terms, to use Morgan Briggs um, term. So things like civilian, combatant, victim, mm -hmm. perpetrator, state, non-state. And these categorizations often conceal the relational nature of civilian protection, how it is co-created by different actors in and through their relationships with one another. So in the paper, I use a relational approach to illuminate these dynamics within civilian protection in South Sudan, um, which is one of my primary field sites and somewhere where um, I've spent a lot of time over the past two years. Um, and this approach can help us to explore questions about the variable impact of different regulatory styles of protection. So, for example, how a hierarchized form of military protection, like armed peacekeeping, shapes relationships with those um, and among those affected by conflict. And then what difference might it make if protection architectures were more civilian in nature, 
um, as is the case with unarmed forms of civilian to civilian protection, which is the primary focus of my PhD research. Um, and these different protection models will shape relational dynamics that in turn shape security and safety in vastly different ways. So in South Sudan, um, protection is something that is regulated by a range of actors, um, peacekeepers, NGOs, UN police, communities themselves, the government, non-state armed groups, to name just a few. And accounts of civilian protection in South Sudan not only need to encompass a much broader range of actors, but they need to investigate the interactions between these entities. The paper maps some of these and, and the implications that this has. The point of mapping these relationships is to better understand where power resides so that unjust and unequal structures can be transformed. This moves beyond a thin relationality, um, as Morgan Briggs, Mary Graham's colleague at UQ, terms it, um, or conceptualising the world as it stands, um, to instead call attention to the ways that structural inequalities and power imbalances shape protection. So within this, I have a micro case study exploring the effects of protection architectures on relationships. So the picture here is of a UN police officer from Ghana conducting a mass cordon and search operation in the Bentu protection of civilian site, um, which is one of the camps um, on a UN base to which civilians fled at the start of the civil war. And mass cordon and search is where UN police section off an area and they secure it so that people can't enter or exit. And they systematically search that area and dwellings within um, for weapons and other contraband. So things like alcohol, petrol, permanent building materials and weapons. Um, and the UN do this in part to ensure that the site doesn't become militarized because then it would be unprotected under international law. In so doing, this shapes the relationships that they're able to build with communities. UN police reported in interviews that they try to make relationships positive so operations like mass cordon and search can be conducted. I have a quote there from a senior UN police official um, from Juba POC, um, in which she said she emphasizes that addition, in addition to doing a proper search um, in the sense of thoroughness, she expects officers to conduct, conduct searches with a smile. We are guests in this country and we are entering someone's home. That means you can do this with a smile. You can be polite. You can take time to talk to them. This stands in very stark contrast to what the community themselves reported about these interactions with police. So um, the other quote on the right hand side um, is from is from a, a resident of the POC and also someone who works for a protection NGO who said that they, the community, don't know what UN police want. They're just the people that are searching their things. The question then becomes how different actors in this relationship can perceive it so differently. Why is there this discord? And I argue in the paper that the hierarchical architectures of protection set up create hierarchical conditions for relationships. So you can do things with a smile, but the protective architecture restricts the terms of those relationships. POC residents are prevented from exercising autonomy within their homes and within the boundary of the POC site. So even with the best intentions of UNMIS personnel to greet people kindly, to speak and acknowledge more, the act of searching someone's home leaves little space for real engagement or choice on the part of the resident of the POC. Actions that assert power over in this way dovetail with gendered, racial, economic, and political power differentials that leave space and opportunity for abuses of power. And these dynamics are also exacerbated by inconsistency in the ways that UN police relate to community members. So although they might be conducting a search with a smile and ease one day, the next day, as occurred during my field work, field work um, they can be kicking in a door unannounced at 5 a.m arresting your neighbours. Mm. So the overarching blended enforcement protection mandate that UN police have ultimately shapes the efficacy of their relationship building efforts. The question then becomes what can be done to shift these structures and therefore the protection outcomes and the relationships dynamics that they engender. And my thesis research dovetails at that point um, as part of an answer to that question, looking at different forms of protection mechanisms 
that centre relationships as a form of protection. So perhaps I can speak a little bit on that later, but for now I'll leave it here and I'm so glad to, to pass over to Dr. Mary Graham. Thank you. So will I, I'll start? Yeah, will I start? <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, thank you. Just remember, uh, we've got a, like five or six five minutes. Five minutes. Yep, yeah. okay. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, so uh, that was very interesting, what you just said there before, Felicity, about that uh, idea of how they behave, the, uh, of, uh, the security. Um, in Aboriginal terms, um, I see that as autonomous regard being put in place, actually. So and that comes out of the relationality, uh, relationalism, uh, rather than a, a relationalist ethos, rather than a survivalist ethos. Survivalist ethos, it's not either or, we are all relationalists and, and survivalists, um, but uh, the ethos that, are, that can come out of both is that you are caring for something, the relationalist, larger than the self, larger than the personal, collective, uh, group, community, even state, with the small s, state, self. Um, and a survivalist ethos is where the individual, would, no matter what their uh, position is in, in, in the country, in the society, um, that they are alone in the world, in a sense. Uh, they, have, they are a discrete entity, um, a, psycho um, uh, a conscious isolate, so they see the environment, no matter what the environment is, whether it's peaceful or not peaceful, actually, as always, always hostile. And they have to arm themselves and so on, psychologically, uh, administratively, um, physically, of course, you know, with, with or without weapons. So attitudes and so on and so on. Uh, Aboriginal people worked out over a very long period of time, and this is still in place in many places, you're an autonomous being. Women are definitely autonomous beings, um, but we are all autonomous and you treat people at a slight distinct uh, distance um, beca because you are recognising their autonomy and they are supposed to be, in the, in the traditional sense, they do see you as an autonomous being too. So no um, hierarchy no hierarchical kind of sense, but uh, a flat heterarchy society uh, or lateral, if you like, uh, and so on. Now that, that goes for um, uh, any kind of situation. Um, it could go from uh, the, the philosophical, uh, the way you actually do treat each other in this personal way, right to uh, some other, um, on a spectrum, you know, uh, things like, for example, the we've heard of the uh, Chatham House rules, the rules for having a meeting, right? Uh, just imagine it's uh, autonomous regard rules that you abide by. So it's a, how you have to treat other people in this way. You have to, you enter into this space of meeting, um, uh, negotiations and so on in this, in this regard. And I like the word regard better than respect because regard is a kind of a, at a distance. You see people properly at a distance and uh, it's like respect multiplied 10 times. <laughs> um, so, uh, and you always see the other or others uh, in this way. So every different language group, every different group in Australia, uh, we're always uh, had to look at each other in this way. We're all autonomous people, plus we're autonomous groups though too. And so they have to treat each other on this, in this particular way. Um, and what comes from that is this idea of a law of obligation, relationalism, law of obligation comes out of this relationalist uh, view of life. Um, so, and you can see it in the West sometimes. For example, I always give the example of something like the, the National Health Service. From an Aboriginal point of view, you could see that as the uh, law of obligation. It's, it looks after with very good quality health care for everybody and it's free and it looks after everyone. It's not specialised, uh, there's no rankings there, you know, you don't look after all the wealthy, powerful people first before other people and so on and so on. Um, in the environment, you have small fairy uh, beasties. Um, they're protected by little nature bridges over the highway 
uh, under the highway, and and that's a that's a law of obligation too. So anything like that, you could call it a um, a sacralized ecological and social uh, stewardship system. That's essentially what it is. So it's not a philosophy. It's not a. Uh, it is not a um, religion either. It's more like the German word Weltanschauung, Weltanschauung, a worldview. That's all it is. So you can be a Christian and a, and have this idea, <laughs> and be be like this too. Um, I think they'll. Will I leave it there? That's, is that enough? Well, you've That's got enough. a few. You've got a few more more minutes, oh, right. Mary. Maybe oh, one right. more of your oh, wonderful right. framing comments about relationality. All right. Well, well, it does away with hierarchies. That's the big kind of dangerous thing, I suppose. <laughs> you can't have hierarchies with this. It's a flat system. You know, so um, autonomy also means um, uh, well. The, the the four main things to do with uh, relationalism is autonomy. That's a big one. Uh, balance, balance in all things. Men and women are definitely in balance. So you have you have to have a gendered governance, real gendered governance, running society basically. Um, so power and authority. Power and authority, authority are knowledgeable people. I mean, it stands to reason, doesn't it? It's quite logical. You want somebody to run, the people who run the country ought to be knowledgeable people. And knowledgeable means ethical too, you see, uh, for us, for, for, for this. You're, if, you're, if you're not ethical, you're simply not knowledgeable. You don't know anything. So you don't have people like that running things. So you have uh, the authority people, and they're not always old people, gray hair and white hair. They're very smart self good self managing young people you know who have ethics and so on and so on. so that's the authority but they don't rule like kings and queens this is even the ancient you know the old system and the modern system you don't have that um you mustn't have that but of course it's been interfered with with colonialism and power is you know the old saying about power to the people or for the people well this is an ancient system that actually put that into place that actually structured it like that so the people all the people they that's where power must reside you would you you simply wouldn't have had a system where millions of people around the world different countries for different reasons rioting and um you know complaining about how they're ruled by the government how what is happening and it goes from all kinds of things from well COVID, i guess um but things like um you know it's simply getting too expensive to live or something or yeah, they're, they're not living a very good life and so on and so on you know um that just simply wouldn't happen because the people would not allow the authority the, the authority the authority people to carry out policies like that so this idea of a, a law of obligation um um, um, uh, autonomous regard would be for policies too. It would be the bottom line of policy making in, in all kinds of areas. So you know, it's it's a very different old system, but it's been interfered with. As I said, um, government has these policies; you have to carry them out, and so on. And uh, unfortunately, they don't listen to anything uh, very much. Uh, from Aboriginal people's ideas about how to carry out policies, because they forget that we actually, you know, in a very, very different way to other old cultures, we ran a whole country once, you know, we actually did, you know, so, and one of the key things is not to invade other people's countries, have conflict, but don't go around invading other people's countries, you know, you'll never have security otherwise, and Aboriginal people did have that, they had stability and security. So don't don't think of it as uh, all vir pursuing virtue or mor moral philosophy or anything like that. It's more like um, uh, always in, uh, not even in pursuit, but always trying to have a, a stable, efficient society. And the main thing is for um, future generations, descendants. So you are tied up in time, you know. Ancestors are there, very important, but you don't worship them. You don't worship anything, see? nothing at all. So this is where this autonomy comes from. You don't worship anything, um, but always on a on a with an eye on the for for a, a, a good stable um, uh, a political and social ordering system for future generations. It sounds ideal, but it isn't. It's it's to do with uh, efficiency. I, I I always think that it has become quite clear that empires, maybe they always have been, but they're highly inefficient. You know. <laughs> mm.
Thanks so much, Mary. And I think so much of, of those points that you've made, I've been working in the area of environmental regulation mm. and those ideas about, you know, the need to take into account the, the non-human world, the more than human world, the future generation. They're, they're all things that, you know, indigenous cultures have, have been very, mm. very conscious of and now mm. is just starting to come into the sort of the, the regulatory systems of the global north. So yes. um, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we, we've got half an hour left. W what we thought we might do is for each of the panel members just to make a comment or to ask a question of one of the other panel members. And then we're going to turn to um, uh, we're, go we're going to turn to questions from the floor. Um, so I wanted to to start just because I had this experience um, two weeks ago where I was reading Felicity's um, excellent article um, about relational ways of, of peacekeeping while I had my nine-year-old daughter having a complete temper tantrum <laughs> meltdown. Like she was raising the stakes like you would not believe. And I was very tempted to respond it as a as a very violent peacekeeper, but I was reading Felicity's um, article about the importance of, you know, various other ways that we can approach things and trying to draw on my creative relational skills. And, and I really did find it very inspiring, Felicity. But I was wondering if you could tell everyone else just one of the, um, one of the three case studies that, that you um, discuss in your paper, because um, I do think it puts in really lovely concrete form what this means to approach things from a, a relational perspective and what um, regulatory options really does it does it open up thanks Miranda I'm glad that I had a a, um, a non-violent influence on you um, of course Saskia is happy um, <laughs> Uh, so yeah, the, the paper that, that Miranda is referring to um, is again one that's currently under review um, on, on relational R2P. So what does a relational R2P. form of responsibility to protect look like? Um, in which again, I am using a lot of Mary's and, and Morgan's work and I really encourage everyone to, to read as much as they can. Um, you'll learn a lot. Um, and the three case studies that I use in that paper um, explain, um, it's less of a critique, the, what I explained today, and more of an explanation of how relationships can, can be used as a form of protection. Um, and I, I study unarmed civilian protection, um, and I worked for the last year in Bentu, Bentu Protection of Civilians site in South Sudan um, with a team of South Sudanese civilian protection um, workers who, who protect people without um, using any form of arms. Wow. So one of the examples that I give in that paper is the work of the women's protection teams in South Sudan. Um, there are teams in a number of locations around the country, including in Bentu. Um, and in Bentu, they've been doing things like, um, it's a group of women that come together, they use nonviolent strategies to collectively protect particularly other women who are at risk of sexual and gender-based violence when they move outside of the protection of civilian site, but also within the site um, from, from family violence. Um, and they work together to provide protective accompaniment to women who are collecting firewood and water and cultivating their farms. Um, they organize collectively to move in groups because that's a safer way um, to move in that area. And they also create relationships with many of the actors in that area that can be the cause um, of, of risk, of risk of violence. So different armed actors um, from different state and non-state armed groups, they cultivate relationships with them and with other NGOs um, to, to create a form of connection that becomes protective because the, the more we know one another, um, the less inclined we are um, to harm, at least in this case. So that's one of the three case studies that I use in that paper. And hopefully um, <laughs> there'll be a quick publication turnaround and everyone can read it soon. Thanks for the question, Miranda. <laughs> okay, maybe I'll hand to you then to ask um, someone else a question. 
Yeah, I, I've, I've really been nodding my head um, when hearing Mary speak about um, autonomous regard. Um, and I guess this is a question perhaps that all of the panelists can perhaps give a quick answer to. Um, I've noticed in my own work, people really talk about um, the need for, a, and you kind of spoke about this too, Miranda, in, in responding as a parent, mm -hmm. the need to kind of center yourself and to know yourself in order to know others. Um, so autonomous regard also being a sense of self-regard. Um, mm -hmm. And that really brings back, there's a Joan, a Joan Didion essay called The Source of Self-Regard. That's really what was going through my head. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering, um, yeah, how, how that sense of self whether in intervention or in regulation um, has played into the different forms of research that, that others have spoken about today? Hmm. Uh, well, um, I suppose uh, the, when, when um, Miranda, you're talking about the <laughs> uh, tantrums, uh, <laughs> I was thinking that the, this idea of relational, the relationalism, this old idea, um, and uh, uh, autonomous regard, it helps with reflective motive, uh, having a reflective motive about things. Like tiny babies, they don't have to, they don't, and they don't have reflective motives. <laughs> they just see what they want, you know, some, uh, I don't know, a used tissue under the table or something, and they're crawling over there, and they will have that. They want that, they get it, and uh, they test everything by eating, of course, you know, so, <laughs> and, and of course, you just save them in, t in the nick of time kind of thing from that. But it's perfectly reasonable, and that's normal, you know, for tiny babies and uh, toddlers and that, but a reflective regard comes with um, observation, um, especially uh, proportionalizing of things. And I suppose that's what Indigenous people have done, but a lot of Indigenous, you know, all around the world are observing their, um, their uh, environment, uh, the natural environment, of course, but the human environment and, and so on. Um, I guess, you know, yeah, that would, that would come into it a lot, the motive for things your motive uh, and that goes with um, uh, figuring things out through observation. How does one thing fit with another? How do people fit together? How does this fit with that and so on and so on and but it takes consideration but also time and distance and thinking and discussing and, and so on and so on I guess. Uh, so a pause you know before acting without thinking you know. Um, I suppose that comes into a lot of our kind of discussions about things. So we discuss and we discuss Aboriginal people among themselves. Um, the other thing I want to say in relation to that too, Felicity, what you're saying about um, uh, security. Uh, part of the colonial thing of this country is we end up, we don't have and have, haven't had very good relationships with the police. Very bad, very, very bad, you know. There have been deaths in custody, you might have heard about, you know what I mean? Uh, I've I've grown to call them um, basically uh, murders, murders by the state of Aboriginal people because people in uniforms carrying weapons, they represent the state, you know, so I could blame it straight on racism, but I prefer to do that. Uh, but, um, but it doesn't, it doesn't have to be so because we've also seen, I have, and other people have seen, when we're talking about autonomous regard, we've seen people who, police who naturally do this, who, who are just in themselves, they are like this, very respectful on different communities, you know, uh, around the country, uh, worked out a very good relationship with them. And exactly how you were describing before, the, the people, security people going around. And it doesn't have to be like Kumbaya, you know, it's not that at all. It says that that's, that is what gets the, uh, in a sense, the job done. They do their job very well, very well by doing that, by applying this kind of behavior, a correct behavior. We use the word among our Aboriginal English, you know, proper, proper, you know, uh, means also ethical. We'll say, yes, he's done this in a proper way, so on, so this policeman or that authority figure. Somebody who doesn't do that is just, you know, you don't describe them as anything really. <laughs> They're being in a police in a general way, very ill-mannered and violent, you know, threatening. <laughs> but yeah, I'll just say that. Oh, thanks. Thanks so much, Mary. Yeah, in, um, in Bislama, which is the um, language spoken in Vanuatu, uh, they say straight 
you know, the, oh, the straight, straight way yes. of doing something. The straight way, yes. I think it, there's a lot of um, side thing. With that. Definitely, <laughs> yes. Uh, okay, maybe um, I'll ask Mary Ivek and then Ibi to to comment on that question, and then we could um, maybe open up to um, to to other questions from the audience because there's a lot of um, a lot of chat and um, Q and A coming in as well. Maybe best of all, you, Mary Ivek. Thanks, Miranda. I, I was just wanting to um, just talk to Mary and ask her, like, in, again, in going back to my social work days, Carl Rogers in the 50s sort of referred to this idea of unconditional positive regard and the, yes. to have empathy and to be able to sort of, um, yes, have regard for a person irrespective of their position or what they're saying, but that you, you can actually have this... Um, is empathy and Mary you have written about empathy and I, I, oh, I'm yes. hoping you might sort of ex talk a little bit to that as mm. part of autonomous regard. Mm. Well yes it's well I, I uh, it, it's really to do with this caring about something outside of the self in in the Aboriginal terms it goes way back uh, it's really ancient you know um, becoming human in the country You'll hear elderly Aboriginal people say, yes, um, uh, we don't come from anywhere else. You know, they, it's not that they deny it. They just think that's another story. That's a different story. Uh, but our story is, they'll say, you know, this is the country which grew us up, you see. So it grew us up, made us human, literally. And there are stories exactly like that, Genesis type stories, but from place to place. Uh, so you are obliged forever then to look after it. So the idea of stewardship, custodial ethic, uh, law of obligation, all that kind of stuff, but the, especially the thing of obligatoriness uh, is almost like it's embedded. Um, if you like, it could be like, uh, I, I'm trying to put something together now my, myself at the moment, the, you know, identity is comes in, you know, different hundreds or thousands of different forms. I wonder about having a, um, uh, depending on the kind of social structure, social and political structure you have, uh, and and tied up completely with land, of course, caring for land, that there's a possibility of having an ethical identity, an ethical identity. Do you know? I mean, you might think, well, how is that possible? Do you know, but um, but so it's not just that all the people who, you know, here's a crowd of people, and they're all ethics. You know, ethics is important. Empathy. They know how. They know the meaning of empathy. You know, um, they behave like this. So I wonder if that is. You could say uh, I'm. I'm not sure myself. See, I'm just trying to trying to work this out. Um, an ethical identity. Um, if there were ways in society, all so society, how this could be engendered. Do you know? So, for example, uh, a rite of passage program that I wrote ages ago. It's being um, put into the curriculum of the um, Aboriginal school. So where we used to do this in our own place, in our socialising, general socialising, now we're putting it in a formal way in a school. You know, uh, this is a city school where Aboriginal and white kids go to. Uh, it's an Aboriginal school. Though. So empathy, um, you're taught that. You're, you're actually taught that uh, because at the basis of it, um, in a sense, uh, it's like as if Aboriginal people said, well, we really don't know how to be ethical people you know we don't know about values and all that it has to be embedded from the beginning it's part of our our actually becoming human a fully rounded human is an empathetic ethical person now not good it's just normal part of being human it's it's like that and it's it's not as if to say well some people will be and some people won't be it's taking the notion that um you, you learn this as a skill. In other words, being human is a skill, actually. Not just a physical skill, walking, talking, and going through, but, but learning all that and putting it into place. It's a skill, so, yeah. Thank, thanks, Mary. Um, actually, Valerie Braithwaite, who is, um, I think, also on this call, she's done a lot of work on ethical identity and talks about oh, it as being the best version of yourself. <laughs> Uh, yes, and I, yeah, I, I yeah. found that to be really helpful. That's um, wonderful. Conceptualization. Sorry, what's her name? If I get Valerie Braithwaite. Braithwaite. Right. Thank you. 
Um, I think that I'm going to take some questions now. So, and and maybe the there's a question to you, E.B. Um, from Elizabeth Simpson. She says to E.B. You highlighted how the rhetoric in modern Australian politics has contributed to, or at least been reflected in the FRE movement. Is there a way for relationality to begin to make a positive change in this space as well? I, that, that's mm. such a great question. It is. Uh, very interested to hear the answer. Over to you, Ibi. Um. Yes, I mean, uh, I, I think um, one of the ways that, that I've been and, and Mary, you, uh, Mary Grant just talked about it because one of the ways I try to approach this relationality is kind of um, like to see where is the, you know, to look at the relational ethos, whether they are caring for something larger than themselves. Because the whole purpose of being and existing and what they're mm. fighting for is survival. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the 14 words, which is they, you know, mm -hmm. that, that is the, the words that drive every action is, mm. is all about um, their survival. It's about, um, I should know it by now, we must secure the existence of white people and the future of white children. It's completely mm -hmm. survivalist. It's mm -hmm. completely authoritarian. Um, and, um, and, and also they want to have an exclusive right to to own the agenda for our future like they mm -hmm. want to be the one so yes. you know there's no space there is no room in there for relational worldview mm -hmm. and i was thinking about it that where is there is there an entrance is there somewhere where we can actually approach it and the only things that i'm coming back to is about well try to approach this in with empathy mm -hmm. and also look at the identity i think the only common grounds that we could come to is our identity. And just to adding to this kind of ethical um, identity is kind of going back to other identities identified by Val Braithwaite, which is kind of, you know, our democratic identity that we all want to be heard. I mean, mm. in some way, Ooh, you know, oh. they want to set the agenda. A year ago when I was out there protesting for climate change with my big signs, <laughs> demanding, <laughs> demanding change, I wanted to be heard. I wanted yeah. to contribute to the agenda and I wanted to have an input of setting the agenda for this mm. country. So we kind of share this kind of this, uh, you know, this um, I, other forms of identity that we want to be heard, that we want to be thought of as, as good people, you know, yes. our, our moral identity need, needs to be recognized. Needs and be also there's the kind of the achievement part of um, identity that that needs to be you know what is it that we, we want to achieve so i think in terms of relationality that i'm i'm moving to is that you know try to take this with an empathy even though i'm yes. disagree with the ideology i need to apply identity and try to see the common ground but i guess my yes. question is that um it's, if we still have an opportunity to ask a question to to Mary Graham is that where is the inroad? Where is the crack? Where you can <laughs> yes. get through to people whose yes. whose existence, you know, the the main yes, reason yes. that they exist is the survivalist ethos. <laughs> yes, I, look, I I don't I don't know. I, um, the only thing I could think of is the way the way it seems like we see uh, relationalism and survivalism is that uh, the relationalist ethos. Um, uh, counters or takes care of survivalist tendencies, the survivalist ethos tendencies, that is, it takes care of it. Um, like, for example, um, uh, the, uh, you know, the Treaty of Versailles, you know, the uh, end of World War I. Uh, so, so the others won, <laughs> um, the West, I mean, uh, uh, against Germany and Turkey and so on, so on, so on. Um, but apparently, they, uh, those at that time, they treated Germany very badly. They humiliated it, humiliated it completely. And apparently historians now say, some historians now say that that was one of the, it, it's become more obvious, it's, it was one of the reasons why it opened the door to demagogues, because they did very badly out of it, of course, Germany. Um, and that led the way to Hitler and the Second World War, basically the Second World War. So the treatment of the country was, very, very uh, uh, cruel, as in hu humiliation. Now that is totally against the autonomous regard. You you simply would not do that. Aboriginal thinking would wouldn't do that. It, you, you'd 
you know, them, you might have made them pay, but you wouldn't have humiliated them. You never humiliate the enemy when you, you know, the protagonists can't do that kind of thing. You have a straight out conflict, the old indigenous way is have a straight out conflict, but you always treat the other, the protagonist as a, you know, in this regard, this autonomous regard way. Um, the other ways of doing it is I've been um, really impressed actually lately uh, I don't know how it's going though in different countries that I've heard of pe a lot of people uh, uh, the ones I have heard of in, in the UK a uh, whole lot of people well millions of people around the world they're getting really tired of the weakness of democracy that democracy doesn't really count because governments don't look after their their people you know they don't, they don't and people are complaining so these people have got together to talk about other ways like um, citizens assemblies, people's assemblies, where you bring de de uh, decision making back to uh, a group like, you know, like jury duties, randomly, randomly uh, grouped people of, a, I don't know, a suburb or a region or something like that, but only a few hundred people, something like that, and they make decisions. They, and apparently it has worked in some small area, in some small ways, but I thought that's a wonderful beginning. It brings back to the, first of all, it brings it back to the local, brings it back to ordinary people making decisions. Experts are not allowed to run it. They are there, apparently. This is the rules of it. But I don't know how it's progressing, you know. But they are there to uh, give advice, technical advice about that. But the people make their own decisions about it. And I thought that was great. Um, a, g a good beginning. I don't know how it's going. Another one would be uh, sort of easier, but probably stir up more trouble, <laughs> is... Uh, just, uh, and I'm not against feminism, I'm just saying don't put all your eggs in one basket, um, uh, dwell too much on feminism, uh, just do it. As in, in boards, committees and so on, you just put in place um, um, gender balanced boards and committees and you don't have chair people of one person, you have two always. We experimented recently before it was swept away by the government again, again our own uh, re, re, um, our own uh, representative um, system example. That's how we set it up. We, we went, we ignored democracy. We had a chance at democracy, but we found it didn't really work. So we had another opportunity um, to vote for it. Uh, well, vote for it, uh, to go for it. And something like 80% of the people voted against it. In other words, they voted against democracy. They want to go back to the old system of consensus. And that's what I see evidence of in this, in these uh, people's assemblies, an assembly of people, all kinds of people, um, as a consensus style, you know. Anyway, um, so they voted against it and went to their own. And when they set up their own structure, that's what it was like. It was like very gendered, balanced governance. Um, so I don't see why it couldn't even just start now, you know. <laughs> uh, well, well then I think I will actually then call upon a male to speak oh, on this yes. panel. <laughs> I'm sorry, I know it sounds, but, but it is in balance, you see, you know what I mean? As in, exactly. <laughs> no, it's not overriding it, <laughs> men. Oh, I, I, um, yes. I will actually, I know that there's some comments that Gordon um, wanted to make. So Gordon, oh, right, can, okay. you, can you speak? Um, and then there there are other questions. I'm not sure we're going to get to them, but is that possible for someone to unmute Gordon? I think I'm unmuted. Yes. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Hello, everyone. Nice to see you Hello. all. Um, I'm kind of glad I'm not on the screen because I was on a Zoom call earlier on and I realized that when um, that my kind of lockdown hair and beard is getting a little bit out of control. So, so it's just as well we're doing voice. I, it was a fun, I, I thought this was just a fantastic um, set of um, presentations and observations and uh, sort of very thought provoking. I have a sort of something that I've been tussling in my mind with, with the concept of relationality and, and Smiranda and I've been working our way through it um, is what do you do with it? What do you, how can you, uh, how can bureaucracies, how can institutions use it? If we accept that everything has got threads and everything is in webs and everything is relational and that the past is prologue and everything is backgrounded and foregrounded, is it is just the sheer inherent complexity and com um, uh, almost chaotic nature of the system mean that it 
is insusceptible to being um, to being of use. Um, I keep on thinking of Jack Nicholson in A Few Good Men when he sort of shouted at, at, uh, at Tom Cruise. And he said, you can't handle the truth. You know, it's something that sometimes it is at institutions we, 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 and as individuals, we almost don't want to see what is, what is in front of us. I mean, that was that George Orwell line that said that the most difficult thing in the world is to say what is right in front of you. Um, I think that explains why Felicity's own Paul Officer had this very glass half full version of, of reality. And it's probably something that was very institutionally um, accepted um, within that. So my question is, to, I mean, each and every one of the panel or one can answer, one can't. And my kids are locking in the background. I might need some, some I might need some kind of, some of it, need to read Felicity's paper. Is, uh, is, is how... Um, how can we use these insights from the panel um, and mainstream them for want of, a, want of a better term? Or is it the very complexity of them means that we cannot use them, which means that they're all novelistic and sui generis to an extent? Thank you. Wow. I don't know. Who would like to have a go at answering that? <laughs> Yeah, I can, <clears throat> I can jump in. And I noticed that, Gordon, you mentioned um, Severine Ortiz's work in, in one of your um, comments in the Q&A as well. And I suppose to some extent, the paper that I presented um, and my work as a whole critique some of the work that says, well, relationships are important, but we'll just make better relationships and then we'll get a better result. Mm -hmm. And actually what, what my paper demonstrates is unless you're addressing the structural um, yes. mm. imbalance in power in the space between a police officer and a community member, um, then, mm. then actually it is a bit of window dressing. And I'm very mm. wary of any um, reforms, particularly um, in the UN um, context, as in my paper, that, that suggests that just being nicer to civilians is going to get us anywhere. Mm. Um, because it won't. And so where I, where I am headed with my thesis and where I landed in that paper is that I, I do think um, a lot of the um, civilian mutual collective forms of protection that I've been studying are, are an answer in part to some of that. Um, and, you know, I'm in the US right now, there's a lot of um, discussion about what community safety looks like in absence of some of those um, power unequal structures like policing mm. um, and communities that are implementing safety models that are much more radically mm. centered in mutual aid and mutual protection. Mm. Um, you know, there's definitely a lot more research to be done. Um, and I hope that my thesis will contribute um, some small way to that in the context of civilian protection. But I, I yeah, I'm very cautious when it comes to um, any, any kind of tweaking around the edges of existing mm -hmm. structures that yes. are um, inherently um, yes. empowering yep. to civilians, to community members. Mm. And for me, policing is, is one of those structures. Mm. Okay, well, thank you very much um, for that, Felicity. I'm just conscious that we've sort of come to the, pretty much the end of our time. Um, you know, I think that the, the main theme that's really come out of this panel has been that we can perform this sort of switch instead of seeing the individuals we, and the institutions, we look at the relationships and that can yes, yeah. open up a whole variety of different ways of thinking about yes. regulation. And, you know, clearly there's a lot of work that needs to be done and, and e examples really of how this has happened that we can all learn from. But I think, mm -hmm. you know, we got some really great insights um, into that, this idea of the law of, of obligation, um, the sort of the mm. idea of autonomous regard. I think Mary's idea of, Mary Ivek's idea of, of opening up these mm. spaces, looking for islands of, of civility, yes. looking for those places where there is multiplicity, that, mm. that a, a sort of an emphasis on relationality makes us aware that things are not black and white. There's always, there's a whole lot of different Absolutely. angles. And, being alive to that nuance is Absolutely. often a way forward. Um, yes. 
And so thank you really all of the, um, mm. the panelists for your you. um, participation, really appreciate it. Um, mm. uh, I wanted also just to give a um, advance um, encouragement to everybody to attend the next um, conversation series, which is going to be next week. It's going to be be on the regulatory state across terrains of governance. So Ooh. in this place um, on, the, on the 19th of October, um, and the speakers that we've got are Anna Fieldhouse, Jenna Harb, um, Professor um, Kate Henner, and Walter Johnson. Oh, there's a, a, there's a long list. Um, Professor Veronica Taylor, and also Dr. Anthea Vogel. So, um, you know, a really great lineup of speakers. Uh, so please, if you haven't registered for that, then um, then then do so now, and um, look forward to continuing on with this conversation.